enthusiastisch vooraan, fantastisch. Hoe gaat het met jullie? Goed! Heb jullie zin in een QA met John Rice Davis? Het staat op zijde, dus dat kan op net iets later, denk ik. Wie heeft er zin in de QA met John Rice Davis? Please welcome him on stage, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Rice Davis. I'm holding on filmmaking on the Isle of Man. 
When it's open, I'm going to go out and shake the money tree in order to get some money to make the films that I want to make. And, uh, and they all, well, one in particular, really is about your ancestors. All of your ancestors. Everyone in this room. Uh, because we have ancestors in common. About 60,000 years ago, something happened, and we're not quite sure what. But Homo sapiens, the species that we belong to, had a disaster. We may have been reduced to as many as 10,000 people. Uh, some people say it was under 1,000. And we are all descended from that. Um, it's important that we look at where we are now through the eyes of those who came before us. Because sometimes we are so blinded by our arrogance, our individualism, that we forget that we have a common obligation. Those people survived an ice age when all the other types of hominids died out. They did it because they chose to select for intelligence. In the end of the ice age, until the end of the ice age, you will find male skeletons in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, even their 60s. You will never find a woman over the age of 30. Until the end of the Ice Age, the life expectancy of a woman was 21 years. All of you over the age, only you women over the age of 21, Statistically, most of you would be dead by now. All of you over the age of 30 would be dead by now. Of course, there are always going to be one or two exceptions. We just don't find them. Why? Because when we select for intelligence, we select for a bigger brain. A bigger brain has to be encased in a bigger skull. The biggest skull has to pass through the birth canal. And that bigger skull will either kill women who cannot deliver it, or alternatively, premature babies may be born. Babies that can't run or can't walk immediately after birth. In a way, all humans are born premature. You know, we need, they need at least a year. Uh, at least a year, maybe two years, three years, five years, before they can really start to do the things they can do. Um, so actually, we are all descended from young girls between the ages of about 14 and 20, 21, who did whatever they had to do to make sure that this baby survives. And, and we are all descendants. We are all the descendants of this baby, of that baby. And when we make our our rather effete choices. Oh, I'm going to do this with my life. No, I'm not going to do that. You have perhaps 150,000 years of previous generations looking down on you and saying, is this really what we lived and died to provide? We have got to face our responsibilities as humans in the context of knowing that 
those very smart people who came before us actually were thinking about us and wondering how wonderfully we would live and hoping that we would do better than them. And it's just a different way of looking at ourselves and our condition and things like that. Anyway, it's a love story. It will make you cry at the end. It will make you cheer at the end. And, uh, and it's about us. We are the descendants of the bravest, smartest animals that ever lived on the planet. And we should try and live up to that. Have, have you already written it then? Uh, well, I, I shot a few scenes of it as a teaser, but I haven't gone out to raise the money yet. Um, but it's an important film, particularly this important time. Uh, I mean, we live in extraordinary times. If I had said to you a year ago, you know what? There's real danger of a war in Europe that could turn nuclear. You would all look at me and go, oh dear me, the old boys have lost it. Who would have expected a European war that has the makings of a nuclear exchange? Uh, you see, you cannot, you cannot protect yourself against everything. You know, volcanologists the other day said there's a one in six chance of a major volcanic event this century that will have a massive disruption of human affairs. Now, how do we prepare for that? There is a chance of a meteor strike on Earth which could end the whole world. Yes, we have to give some thought to how that happens. Right at the moment, probably in the next thousand years, but it could be in the next 50 years, our poles are looking as if they could switch. North Pole will become South Pole, South Pole will become North Pole. Well, Actually, that's quite serious because the, the magnetic field that protects the Earth from the sun's rays and from cosmic rays would fluctuate and it would be rather like putting mankind into a microwave and giving us a few blasts uh, on a daily basis until the event was right over. We would lose millions of our people. You can't protect against that. The reason we were unprepared for COVID was because we decided that the major threat is climate change. So we're working to stop temperatures rising uh, by reducing our car carbon dioxide levels. But the point is, you can't cover every contingency. And when you concentrate on one and neglect the others, you expose yourself to being really caught. You know, COVID catches us completely by surprise. Yes, people were saying, oh, we, you know, with you another plague, you know, it's once every hundred years and this sort of thing. But really the plague that we've been concentrating on is global warming, you know, where temperatures are rising and things like that. The truth is, you, we always will get hit by the things we least expect. And smart people plan ahead. Smart people say, what if? 
I live on a little island called the Isle of Man. We have not learned from COVID. We got cut off a little bit from shipping supplies um, for a week or two, and it really looked as if we would not be able to get food in. But we, we secured that, and everything's sorted out now. But the policy now is to raise the number of people on the island to 100,000 people. We've got about 85,000 at the moment. I think that that is done, because I think the risks now of an event that would cut the supply chain off from England and Ireland is quite high. A lot higher than we would have said a year ago. You know, my generation was brought up to look at accusingly at the people who came before us. We would say, why didn't you realize what Hitler was going to do? He wrote about it. He said what he was going to do. Why didn't you listen and prepare? Well, how do we evaluate the risk of Mr. Putin? He is threatening. He's threatening to send a tidal wave 500 meters high across Ireland. God knows the Irish have done nothing to do to it, but they don't matter. And, and then right across Britain, that will leave a radioactive soil for a thousand and effectively wipe out Britain. Um, so how do you evaluate? I mean, is it just technically it's possible? But, I mean, is that a real threat? Should we be worried? But what if he is saying, what, are the, what, what if he's articulating one of the possibilities in his mind? How do we make that judgment? And should we then prepare ourselves for the fact that perhaps, in a lesser scenario, Places like my little island, the Isle of Man, should be thinking of downsizing our population to the point at which we can actually feed ourselves. Uh, life is very complicated at the moment, and we have to commute between totally ignoring any threats at all to worrying too much about the wrong threat. Life is very confusing, but we have to think about the unthinkable sometimes. Well, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we also have to do some questions from the, the, the people here. Does anybody have a question uh, for Mr. Rice? That girl is not allowed to ask the question she was going to ask. <laughs> Oh, first of all, I can do the usual things. No, Orlando Bloom and I did not hang out a lot together. Um, you see, I was 53 and he was 20. And somehow, it would have looked a little bit odd if we'd been hanging out a lot together. Oh yes, Mr. Spielberg is a great director. It was wonderful working with Harrison Ford. Um, right, have I covered some of the questions? Next question. Right. Oh, that lady over there who's waving her hand and has got her back to me clearly has a question to ask. Put her on the Now you have to ask a question. so that I can actually hear the question. Sorry, I was just asking my husband if he had a question that he wanted me to ask. And what was his answer? I don't know. 
point. <laughs> just ask me, yeah, just ask me on the other side. Ah, don't mess with this. Oh. <laughs> um, he was wondering what your best memory in Indiana Jones was. He's a huge fan and wanted to be an archaeologist because he just loved the movies oh. about you. Red is the most art. Every day was, uh, was a new adventure, actually. Um, it was a wonderfully free way of making a movie. Um, but one of my favorite memories is that moment when Amy is fighting the big German, and, and the plane is loose, and the plane hits the it's the petrol bowser and the fire starts. Now we're going to start the fire and we've got three or four cameras on it and we're going to, as soon as the fire starts, we do a little bit of it and then we're going to come in, rearrange the camera, relight the fire, all that sort of thing and, you know, it's going to be a day or two of filming. So we have got the Tunisia fire brigade and they've laid their hoses under the desert sand and covered it all up and Spielberg is saying, all right, let's, let's do this thing now, we'll start the fire and when I say cut, I want the fire put out. Okay, so the action starts, boom, 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 the, 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 the plane starts moving, it hits the bowser, the, the, the water, the, 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 um, the petrol starts burning, and this sort of thing, it gets to the plane, and the plane starts to go out, and Stephen says, all right, cut, put the fire out. And sneaking through the sands, you see these, these, the, these big hose pipes sort of coming under pressure. But unfortunately, the hoses have all got holes in them. So out of these hose pipes, there's suddenly little springs like that. And at the end of the tap, there's a guy like this. <laughs> and it's coming out like that. <laughs> and the plane is going up. And Stephen has to say, start shooting again, shoot when you can, quickly. And basically, we had to shoot until Finally, we got enough there to try and put the plane out. The plane was basically burned out, um, and it wasn't the way it was intended to be. But I have to tell you, you know, this gripping moment when you see these great serpents underneath the sand rippling into life, and you think, oh my god, this looks wonderful. And then you see a little damp patch, and suddenly there's little squirts of sand coming out of every hose pipe, every five yards. And in the end, this guy had nothing coming out. Wonderfully funny. All right, do we have uh, one more question? Oh, wait a minute. We've got two questions here. Come on, your question, sir. Sorry, I'm if you can do Ghibli's voice. Ghibli, you want that dwarf's voice, do you? Well, a young shrimp of a hobbit like you, you'll make a fine warrior one day with a bit of coaching in the use of the axe. Remember that? If ever you are called upon to do wet work, use an axe. Anybody can go. But it takes a real dwarf to use a man. Right. Next question. Okay, so I want to ask uh, which scene you enjoy the most playing? I'm sorry. Which scene you want the reason to enjoy the most playing?
message that we write them now. Hold on, one, one final question. Can I, can I ask you something? Um, I read somewhere that from you, Lee, you were allergic for the makeup and the prosthetics. How uh, hard was it to act in those conditions? No, I, it wasn't an allergy. The prosthetic is very large. One of the reasons why Gimli's eyes are narrow and close together is that I have foam skin from out, out here on either side. It was bonded by medical adhesive. Medical adhesive is hypoallergenic. It will not, you won't get an allergy to it. But it really bonds to the cells of the skin. It's not designed to be taken off on a daily basis. Um, and when you take it off, you take just a few cells with it when you wipe it off. The skin under your eyes is some of the thinnest skin on the human body. It is about twice the thickness of a cigarette paper. Very thin. So after weeks of taking it off, I ended up losing all the skin around my eyes. I looked hideous. And of course, when you do that, the body is saying, oh, we've got injury. Quick, pump fluid there. So the whole face became uh, swollen and Do you remember when you were a little girl, you tripped and you grazed your knee and, and um, you lost the whole top surface and there was that wetness and that pinkness, that pink, that was my face. I looked hideous. Mm. I looked so hideous that my then girlfriend said to me, John, I don't know how to say this to you, but I can't bear to look at you at the moment. I have to go back to LA. It was not a good time. Mm. Anyway, how did I do it? Well, I bore it like a dwarf should. But, remember the great aphorism, certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? Thank you very much. A nice round of applause, ladies and gentlemen.